I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know a few people will probably still be wandering in, but we have a lot of information to cover. Um, we're going to do a little interactive session here in the middle part. Uh, so I'm going to spend about 30 minutes, 20, 25, 30 minutes going through just some factual information, and then we're going to do a little interactive session with the RSNA Diagnosis Live system. So if you know your RSNA login, that'll help for you to uh, get your cell phone or tablet out, and you can interact with us um, for the middle portion of it. We'll talk you through that right before we get started, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, so I am Jim Anderson. I'm the chair of the Radiology um, RRC. Uh, our new name now is Radiology and not Diagnostic Radiology. We haven't changed that slide yet, but uh, we officially changed our names in the ACGME, uh, so you can refer to us as that. Um, I have no conflicts, but don't make me angry. Uh, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry, so just trying to protect myself up here. So we'll talk about the committee, a little bit about case logs, uh, some clarifications on some rules, um, questions that have come up either from individual programs or multiple programs. I'll talk briefly about interventional radiology. I'm not going to spend as much time as I have in the last couple presentations. Uh, there's going to be a more comprehensive talk on interventional radiology on Friday if you're still around. Uh, but there is some information in the slide set that I'll cover very quickly. Um, since this will be posted, you can kind of refer to it um, once it's online. And then we're going to mostly be talking about the diagnostic radiology requirement revision, and that's going to be our interactive portion. Uh, any of the program directors in the audience should have gotten a preview of the draft. Um, before it goes out for public comment, and so hopefully you had a chance to look over that. So just to remind everybody, the Radiology uh, Review Committee uh, has appointing organizations. Uh, there are 12 voting members currently. We have one public member and one resident member. Um, and then ABR ex officio non-voting member sits on our panel so we can stay coordinated with the ABR. These are our current review committee members. Uh, right now, we have an open spot in breast imaging, but that will soon be filled by Janet Bailey, who was appointed, um, and so she'll start in this July. So the core, uh, some decisions that we made at our last meeting, so we're now fully in the next accreditation system, and we're using the uh, annual updates as a screening mechanism, and so we're reviewing every program every year. Some of these get kind of um, passed through on consent agendums, as agendas if they're not having any difficulties and they weren't flagged at all. Um, so 170 programs got continued accreditation. Two had applied for initial accreditation. Those were both AOA, right, Alicia? Yeah, they were both AOA programs. Um, and then a couple had their application withheld or continued pre-accreditation. That would be AOA programs as well. And then there were 14 programs that were requested site visits for clarifying information or to investigate um, some aspect of their program. Um, so far, we've been reviewing the new IR integrated core programs. Uh, initial accreditation, there are 20 programs that are currently accredited. And one application was withheld at this point. There were uh, eight programs that were approved back in November and we have about 25 to review in April. Uh, for the subspecialty programs, there's a lot of subspecialty programs. So 242 had continued accreditation, uh, one initial accreditation. Uh, nobody had any site visits for the subspecialty programs this year, so that was kind of nice to see. Uh, we had a meeting last November, um, and then in February, or, um, Sorry, last, we had one in January, and then our next meeting's in April. Uh, that agenda is closed. Um, and then we're discussing a third meeting uh, probably in September of this year, um, one to potentially finish up some uh, things on the program requirements, but also to do some more of the IR work that's uh, taking up some of our time. And then we'll have our usually scheduled meetings in January and April of next year. That's kind of our continued timing, at least at this point, is that we'll have January and April meetings. So some observations from our uh, reviews. Uh, just to remind everybody, the annual update is a lot of what we go off of when we initially look at the programs. So program characteristics, um, program changes that you put in. And remember, uh, a lot of people are kind of afraid to put in any information about program changes, but really it's an informational piece. It's not something that we're using to 
um, you know, go after somebody or anything like that. It's really to let us know what's going on with your program. So feel free to kind of use those spaces to add information about your program that you think we ought to know about. Um, it really helps us to be able to evaluate the program and get more information up front. Uh, scholarly activity is filled out yearly. Uh, admission of data is always a problem. If you don't fill some portion of it out, um, then you're kind of automatically flagged in some way because we don't know if you didn't put it in properly or if, there was a, if there's a problem with the data. Board pass rate we get from the ABR, uh, the resident and faculty surveys we review, uh, the case logs, which is the clinical experience, so the yearly case log data that you put in. And then for right now, at least milestones, um, we're only evaluating it to see if you're completing the milestones and, and actually doing the online portion of it, but we're not using the milestones to evaluate programs at this point. So case logs still are a problem. I think Larry before me and me now, uh, every time we come up here, we talk about the inaccuracies and we know there's some technical issues, but most of those should have been ironed out by now or you should have figured out at your own program how to work around the technical difficulties with getting the case logs accurate. And really the, the requirement that we're um, citing programs for, or we will start to cite programs for on this, is the fact that the program director is uh, supposed to assess and review for accuracy of the update. And so it's really the program director's responsibility to review that case log data and make sure that it accurately reflects what's going on in their program. Uh, so this year we're having more rigorous follow-up for repeated case log inaccuracies. So if your program's had problems in the past and you're continuing to have problems, we're more likely to be citing your program or finding out what's going on. So here's some of the data from last year. So this is the report date of September 21st, 2015. So it would have been last academic year. And you can see there's some pretty odd numbers in here, 24, almost 25,000 uh, chest x-rays this resident read. I actually wasn't the only person. There were several people that had high numbers like that. And um, even with relatively low minimum requirements, there were still 22 residents that actually had less than 1,900. Uh, so that just seems a little odd, but it's possible. And then the zero numbers always raise a possibility that something's wrong with the system. Um, so mammography, image guide, biopsies, and PET had places that had zero uh, numbers by a resident. So some residents out there that's never looked at a mammogram, apparently, and graduated. So I hope not, but that's possible. Um, but that's what that data basically indicates, is that that person did not look at a mammogram their whole time. Um, so you can see, that, uh, as far as the, uh, these are the number of residents below the minimum standard. So there aren't a lot of people, but there's still a fair number of programs that are having trouble with this. And so you need to really get that fixed up and try and get that data accurate. Um, the other thing that we've seen a lot of is to make sure that faculty licensure and certification information is up to date. So you want to make sure that um, how they're certified and what they're certified by is all put into the system properly and updated annually. Um, multiple faculty rosters had inaccurate or outdated faculty information. So make sure you check that when you're doing your updates for next year. And remember updates, although we typically do them in the fall, um, you can update your ADS system um, throughout the year. So keeping that up to date as people change is sometimes a good idea. Uh, so again, remember, the program director is responsible for the accuracy of the data. Um, you know, we don't want it, and you certainly don't want to be reviewing programs that are just putting in ac inaccurate data. To, it wastes your time, it wastes our time. And so we don't want to have to send out a site visitor or uh, have any kind of adverse action or citation just for something that you can fix up front. Uh, so the more you pay attention to that, the less likely your program is going to get flagged uh, to get reviewed or to get a site visit. Uh, the other thing you can do is print your annual update for your records. Um, it doesn't store in the system permanently, so every year you're going to want to um, print your records or have a copy of it so that you know how to, or you know what you filled out the year before. Um, we are uh, flagging data omissions as well. Here's where you, um, is this the new site or is this the old? So the, the ACGME website was just updated a few days ago. It hasn't changed. 
but this is apparently still for ADS, this is still where you find your um, print, your annual update. So you want to do that sometime in the fall after you've submitted. Uh, just real briefly on the single accreditation system, uh, as you may have heard before, there are 14 uh, AOA radiology programs. I think a little more than 50% have now submitted an application. You saw, uh, if you were around earlier, Gautam showed that three programs just haven't applied at all. Um, so we don't know what's going to go on with those. Uh, they have basically a five-year window to kind of get this process done and get through the system. We're working with them to try and get their programs either approved or altered so that they can be approved in the future. Um, we will be reviewing all of those um, before we can evaluate um, any of those programs. Right now, they are, uh, if they've applied, they're considered pre-accreditation. That's granted upon receipt of the completed application, so that's before we do any kind of review. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go through and review them, and hopefully they'll move on to initial accreditation, but pre-accreditation is a term that we're using for these AOA programs before they've actually gone through and been accredited. Um, note that the pre-accredited programs are still not eligible for ABR certification per the ABR. Um, so you'll just want to make sure that anything, any graduate from a pre-accredited program um, will be eligible for radiology fellowship programs, but you need to check with the ABR about whether they'll be uh, eligible for certification because they need to have the ABR core uh, certificate before they can get the specialized certificate. So even though you let them into your fellowship, they still may not be eligible for the subspecialty certification. So you want to make sure that you check into all, both with ABR and with us as to their eligibility. So some other things that we've been discussing at the review committee level. One thing that we've had some trouble with over the last couple of years is being able to really evaluate new program director requests. Uh, the same form has been used for quite some time as to that, as to how we review that. And it's somewhat limited in its information. So now um, when you apply for a new program director, um, you're going to need to submit a full faculty CV as well as a letter of support from the DIO um, to give us some more information on the qualifications of the faculty member. Before, it was a fairly limited amount of information that we had, and it was really difficult to tell whether someone was truly qualified. And the committee as a whole pretty much agrees that the program director still is the most important uh, cog in the whole process and that, um, you know, we really want to make sure that the right people are in charge of the programs and running the program. So uh, making sure that you appoint or select the right program director and have someone that's well qualified is uh, important to us and should be important to you. We announced um, this whole change in process back in November on an e-communication, so make sure you check your e-communications because we do uh, send out information in that manner so that you can be updated. A couple questions we've gotten from either programs or multiple programs. Is it possible for more than one resident to take credit for the same case? This applies to the case logs and how you count the case logs. Um, so we've had lengthy discussions about this, and the, the real intent of this is that you should have enough cases for the residents, and you shouldn't, the minimums are fairly low. They should be able to um, have enough cases individually. And so except for the I-131s, which we realize are sometimes a problem at some, some of the smaller programs particularly, um, that you really can't share cases in the sense of counting them twice for a case log entry. Um, so you can't put multiple um, residents' names on a report and then count them multiple times for their case logs. And then kind of a related question in a way is can residents read cases for hospitals or imaging centers that are not officially part of the uh, teaching program. We consider that that's um, some of the educational material that you have available at your institution. And as long as those external cases are being used for education and supervised by the program faculty, so they wouldn't really count um, if you're using them, if you're using a residence kind of as almost moonlighting type situations where they're reading independently and not being overread by um, faculty. Um, but as long as they're being overread by program faculty and you're documenting these cases, um, then those cases are kind of allowed to be counted. And then 
uh, kind of one of the more important questions. Can a clinical year obtained abroad count for the required preliminary year for entry into diagnostic radiology residency? Uh, and the short answer is no. Uh, we talked about this last year and we made an exception because the information hadn't really gotten disseminated well um, before the match last year. And so we, we made an exception, but for all residents entering PGY2 as of July 2017, um, the preliminary must be in an ACGME or one of the Canadian programs. Uh, there still will be exceptions for the AOA clinical years. So if you have uh, matched a person that's an AOA, has performed or is enrolled in an AOA clinical year, um, that still will count, but there are no other exceptions for the uh, IMGs. So a little bit about interventional radiology and ESR, just to remind anybody that hasn't heard this before. Uh, we are looking at integrated applications right now. Uh, we have appointed a, a kind of a pre-review committee, the IR advisory committee, that's seven IR specialists that are helping us review these to look for kind of the a specialized content of these applications. Uh, we have a list of the approved IR programs on the ACGME website, and there's also a list of the ESIR approved programs on the website as well, so you can look up which programs have gone through the process already. Uh, some of the things we've been finding with the application, uh, we've noticed that several DR programs are planning to decrease, so they're just switching over their funding basically from the DR to the IR program. Some have gotten new funding. Um, but the vast majority seem to be transferring um, the positions from one program to the other. Um, one thing we need to note is that for the IR programs, they need to have their own CCC and PEC. Uh, they can't just borrow kind of the DR program. Uh, they're really two separate programs and they need to be evaluating their programs separately. Uh, you can have members that are on both types of committees, but you really need to send a report or write up a report and findings um, from each of the committees. Um, when you're looking at your total numbers, make sure that you keep your 7,000 exams for both the DR and IR residents. Um, generally, that's not too much of a problem, but you don't want to overextend your uh, resources. And then those programs, particularly in the IR world, that have a moderate or low procedural volume, um, we're kind of making note of those programs when they're applying for the integrated um, positions. And when they come up for an independent, if they're going to apply for an independent IR position as well, uh, we'll be kind of looking at them closely to make sure they have enough resources to really justify having um, however many residents they're requesting. Uh, so you will kind of combine the total number of trainees in IR for those. Uh, just to remind people of the key facts about the integrated program, you'll be able to match from medical school into the PGY2 uh, program. Some people set it up as categorical programs, but they'll enter the IR program and PGY2. It's a prelim clinical year and a five-year program. Uh, the first three years are essentially diagnostic radiology training with some IR sprinkled in, much like um, the DR programs now. Uh, they'll take the ABR core exam still at the same point in time as the regular DR residents, so after 36 months of uh, radiology training. And they'll do the last two years primarily in IR, but there are allowances for some DR rotations. And all of that will qualify for the new IR-DR uh, certificate from ABR. So one thing about the PGY-5, or however you want to call it, DR-4, IR integrated 4, uh, that can have some DR components. Certainly, we expect that some places will have nuclear medicine, mammography, and potentially call or float type rotations uh, during that year, and those are allowed. Uh, there will also be rotations, what we call in the IR domain, so they're IR-related rotations uh, that may not be actually like in the IR suite or under IR faculty, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and then there, can, there also needs to be patient care or um, oriented rotations, so an ICU, a critical care rotation involved in that training as well. Basically, this is kind of how it breaks down for the three different types of pathways for IR. They all end up having 96 weeks, and it's easier to kind of talk about weeks because people have different variations of rotations. Um, but if in general, if people are giving 12 weeks in the PGY two through four years, 
then this kind of breaks it down as to the number of IR or IR related rotations you need in the PGY5 and six years or if you're doing ESIR and, and one year of independent, how many weeks you'll have to do uh, in PGY-5 and then in the final um, IR independent year. And then, if you, of course, if someone's doing an independent only in the full two-year um, residency, uh, they'll do all that in IR and IR-related rotations. Uh, they'll have the option to have some amount of um, elective time in that, too. So what are IR-related rotations? It's a little bit long, and I'm not going to read through the whole thing because it'll be posted. But basically, this is some guidelines that we've come up with to um, give some amount of guidance to the whole IR-related question. It still doesn't give very specifics because we found that it's kind of impossible to nail it down for every program. If we were, it'd probably be too prescriptive, and people wouldn't be able to... Um, follow along, but if you kind of get the general idea that we want it to be oriented towards procedures and periprocedural patient care, uh, so at least 50% of the rotation time should um, go towards that, you should have about, at a minimum, 30 varied procedures in that four-week procedure. And when we say varied, what does that mean? Well, it can mean a lot of things, but it shouldn't be all doing one thing. So you shouldn't just be doing like a uh, lung biopsy the whole month, and that's all you do. You should be doing a variety of procedures um, during that four-week period. And um, if you don't have, if you have a rotation that you think still is very procedural and uh, <laughs> periprocedurally patient care oriented, and it doesn't really kind of fall into these rules when you apply, um, just explain it to us. So you can write it out longhand, however you need to, just explain it to us. We need to understand why that particular rotation would count as an IR related, and then we'll be able to assess it more easily than if you just try and like fit it into some uh, algorithm. Uh, so if you have something that doesn't really seem obvious, uh, just feel free to write that out longhand and let us know. So the overall purpose is to provide clinical experience, uh, or if the rotation is to provide clinical experiences outside of IR, such as in the oncology service, you want to make sure that your residents are still seeing a substantial number of patients in a clinic or on inpatient rounds, and kind of, again, 30 is a nice guide as far as how they should see patients. So again, if they're rotating through other areas outside of radiology, just make sure it's a, a true experience and it's not... Um, you know, kind of a vacation month or whatever. Um, some special cases, vascular imaging could be acceptable um, because it's felt to be in the core um, realm of uh, knowledge for IR. Um, if you're going to include research in an application for ESIR or um, your IR um, integrated uh, program, uh, make sure that the research is done in IR and not somewhere else. And at least in ESIR, probably no more than a month should be uh, potential. And really, um, it's probably better not to have research in your ESIR um, application, but a month would be allowed. And then breast interventions can count as an IR rotation, but it's kind of double dipping if we count that as an IR rotation and your mammography, uh, part of the three months of mammography that you're supposed to have. So... Some places, of course, have where they're intermingled and you can't really tell the difference between the interventional and the breast rotation. You're doing both. You'd need two of those. So you'd need one to count towards your um, 12 weeks of mammography requirement, and then you'd count another rotation, so a fourth month or four more weeks of rotation to count as your IR-related um, activity. Um, so if you have questions about that, I can answer those. Uh, ESIR, it's part of the DR program. Um, it takes kind of advantage of that R4 year flexibility. Remember, it's not a separate program. You're not getting site visited for it. Um, it's an approved curriculum in DR. And so you need to understand that there's no match for it. That's an internal decision by the program. Uh, this just reiterates about the breast, uh, the 12 weeks of breast. And, but remember, if your residents are reading mammography during that month, those numbers can still count towards the 240. 
because they don't have to necessarily occur in a rotation. So they still need to do the 12 weeks and the 240. If some of the 240 comes during an extra month of doing breast interventions, that would still be allowed to count for the 240. Uh, applying for ESIR on the new website, um, under radiology, there's a document section, and then the, you get a list of documents over here, and that's where the application uh, guidelines are, so you'll have to navigate through the new uh, website to be able to find that. This is just kind of a typical ESIR block diagram. Typically, people are putting three rotations or 12 weeks in the first three years and then sprinkling in IR um, rotations as well as potentially some IR-related rotations, such as an MSK procedural rotation or a body procedural rotation in that last year. And then you need your ICU um, or some kind of uh, critical care month as well that's in that block diagram. We're defining rotations as four weeks. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions about four weeks or a month or two weeks or three weeks. And really, if you're not running four-week blocks of time, if you're running either months or you're running two-week or three-week blocks, then just convert them to weeks and let us know how it all works out. Um, because otherwise, it just gets really confusing to talk about rotations. Um, so for an ESIR, you need a minimum of 44 weeks in IR or IR-related and then another additional four weeks of critical care experience in your application. So just make sure when you're applying for that, you have that kind of well laid out for us. I show this slide pretty much all the time because I just took a lot of time to make it, and so I like to show it. <laughs> <laughs> but so I got some pretty good feedback about making it understandable. So right now, when you're training your DR, you have these people and they come up with your DR complement. Some portion of that time in their first three years is in IR right now. And then maybe a little bit more of your people are doing some specialized training in IR in their fourth year. So that blue along with the fellow kind of comes up with your IR training capacity. Your fellows, of course, are your complement, but your capacity really is all the blue color. And your DR capacity is kind of all your purple color. In the new system, uh, what you're going to do is just replace those fellows with kind of some combination of this group of people here. What's going to happen, you're still going to have a little DR or IR in your DR training here. That'll be equivalent over here. And what's probably going to happen is the people that you're left with in your DR program in this year are going to have less interest in IR, and they'll probably be over here training. And so this uh, purple will kind of decrease and the red will kind of increase. Uh, so you're really just kind of switching where people are as far as training. And if you add ESIR, this might even decrease more because you may have taken one or two of your residents that are very interested in IR and having them heavily training in um, IR and then left the rest of left over people are kind of more exclusively in DR. And this may actually turn almost totally purple or uh, pink instead of blue. So. So what's our current situation with the IR residency? Uh, we've had 63 programs apply. 56 of those are from current IR fellowships. So we've had some new programs uh, that didn't have existing fellowships apply. We've got more applications coming in. At the November meeting, we had eight programs approved. In January, uh, 12 out of 13 uh, programs were approved. And we have 25 to go through in April. We're not officially reviewing independent applications yet. Uh, the integrated programs have kind of variably shown what their interest is in independent. Um, so we don't have a clear sense of that yet, but we're getting a better and better idea. And if you come on Friday, I can explain kind of what our predictions are for that. Uh, we don't know yet how many non-fellowship programs will apply for the independent spots. Uh, whether it'll, there'll be some new programs that want to start their own IR residency that's the two-year program. And we're waiting to get through the integrated programs, and we're, there's a few technical issues with starting to review the independent programs that we're getting settled at the ACGME level. As soon as we get that figured out, we'll start looking at the independent programs. We're hoping that sometime in this next year, uh, those will be starting to be reviewed. Of ESIR, uh, we've, we've received 33 total. Um, there are a total of 185 programs, so we're expecting that we're going to get a bunch more. Um, well, not that necessarily everybody's going to have an ESIR program, but we would think that more than, a, than the number that we've had. 
We've reviewed 13. We've got 17 more to review in April and then a few that are still hanging out there. Um, just from what programs have indicated, there's going to be about 60-ish positions in those 33 applications. That uh, may be a little generous, but at least that's what people are kind of hoping to be able to train. So um, if we put a deadline on when this is going to apply, we expect that a lot more will come in and then we can get a better estimate of um, Uh, we can get a better idea of how many uh, positions we'll have available for that. So real quick, and in this I'm just going to glance over because this is more for you to review um, once this is posted. This is just the situation for current DR residents um, and how they can transfer over to their own integrated programs if they needed to. Um, so that just kind of lays that out. The big question is that I've heard is won't everyone switch into the integrated and there won't be any fellowship positions left over? Well, remember the current match that's going on right now is for fellows uh, for a year from now. So you're filling this spot right now. So unless you already know you've got somebody transferring over, you're going to fill up all your spots for this. So even if you transfer over, you're not going to have any funding for this person. So at least through 2018, there shouldn't really be any change. For these last two years of the fellowship positions, it's possible that some people may switch over and then they may decrease some fellow complement at these individual places. But this is only a few programs at this point. So it's not all the fellowships that are um, doing an integrated program. So we don't really see that it will impact. And in, in some ways, the way the match works for the um, fellowships anyway, you can kind of say you're going to stay at the same institution, which is basically the same situation as what happens if you transfer over. Um, so it's really not that much different. Um, so just to reiterate, if my resident at OHSU wants to go into IR and we're approved, I could transfer them into our IR program at my institution, but I can't send them down to UCSF and have them transfer to that institution. If they, want to if they want to train down there, they're going to have to apply for the fellowship. So if your resident wants to go somewhere else, uh, there's only one thing that for them to do currently. Um, and again, I can't reiterate this enough. Transfers between DR and IR uh, have to occur within the same institution, and they should occur at the changeover of an academic year, and that the final two years of training in the integrated should occur in the same location, so they can't really transfer during that last year. Um, this just goes through where the interns that have already matched and are finishing up this year, what their options will be. Uh, this was the current fourth years that just matched into DR and what their options will be for different training pathways. Uh, this would be our current third years, so next year's match. Some of them will be able to match into IR directly, and that's these people's options. And then this is it, uh, the options for the next year's match if you're going to match into DR either with ESIR or without or if you're going to internally transfer or if you just finish DR and then go on into a two-year independent program. So lots of options for the different students. They need to understand this if you're advising them. Uh, using these tables is very helpful to be able to give them the options that are available to them. The last VR fellowship will be in 2019-20. So that's the match that occurs in the spring of uh, 2018, and then they voluntarily withdraw by June 30th, 2020. Uh, so right now, uh, we're still reviewing. They're getting site visited. Um, we're waiting on the independent residency. We're working with NRMP for the match development for integrated for the eventual independent match. Uh, we have to kind of work on the lead time for that match for PGY2 and then for the independent um, timeline, so that's been a lot of work. Uh, just to kind of again show the first independent match that occur in the 1819 timeline, last fellowship year. If you have an ESIR resident, this will be their fourth year, and this will be the first independent year. Key dates, uh, get, your get your applications in, especially if you're doing integrated. Uh, especially if you want to get into the match for next year. Uh, the last fellowship match, 2017-18, last, um, or the first independent match, 18-19. The fellowship year ends then, and the residence for IR independent will start in 2020. This is my favorite um, quote about fear, and there's a lot of fear out there about what's going to happen. 
Uh, just let it pass through. It'll go away. Um, so we're going to talk. We're going to switch over and do the program requirement revision. We're doing interactive with Diagnosis Live, uh, so I'm going to switch over to that real quick. And uh, if you know passwords to RSNA, you can start logging in with your phone. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so and Larry Davis, the past chair of the RRC, is going to help me run this. I'm going to wander around and uh, so I can avoid uh, things that are being thrown <laughs> and dodge uh, while he runs the program up here, and I'll answer some questions from down there. Uh, I'm not going to take questions from the audience during this. Uh, we'll save those for the end so we can get through this whole presentation, and then we'll save time for questions at the end. Um, so what we've done right now, currently, it's uh, being reviewed internally by ACGME to make sure all the language is uh, correct. We're going to post it for public comment probably within a month or two. Felicia won't tell me. Um, <laughs> review, and then once we get the public comments, we'll review and respond to the public comments. We then submit it to the Committee on Requirements. Uh, we'll have to address any concerns that they have, and then we submit it to the ACGME Board for approval. Uh, the likely timeline is we're trying to shoot for the board approval in February of 2017. Uh, we won't be able to make the fall meeting for this. Um, so given that timeline, if they approve it in 2017, the effective date will end up being July 2018, so that'll give programs a chance to make any adjustments that they need to. So there's a long, time, long lead time into this, um, and so hopefully you can all adjust if needed. Um, and then once we get that done, we'll have to look at the IR requirements to keep the two programs kind of in alignment and make sure language isn't contradictory. Uh, we did send the draft out. We're not posting it yet for public comment, but we will be soon. Um, but we'd like to hear people's input. Um, and there's still some editing that needs to be done. Uh, we really did this more as a courtesy to kind of give you advanced warning. So. Diagnosis Live, uh, if you go to live.rsna.org, live uh, there's an audience response. There should be uh, one, of the pro, or one of the courses should be listed as RRC update. Uh, so just click on that you want to play on that one. You can log in with your RSNA log information, or if you don't know that, you can actually log in with some social media link if you happen to know that. Uh, so go ahead and try and log in if you have your tablet or smartphone or whatever. Uh, and then as soon as you're logged in, we've already got 38 people um, logging in, so that's pretty good. Yep. All right, and Larry Davis will take over. I'm going to go dodge the poll. <laughs> so we've got 43. Come on, guys, this is going to be fun. <laughs> <clears throat> so many of you know me. Where did I grow up? I've only had nine people, ten people oh. answer the question. <laughs> so, we need to answer the questions within about 10, 15 seconds, because if you wait too much longer, silence is deadly like that. So we got about half. So since this is just a test question, you know, it's not for real, we're going to move on. And that's not doing it. OK. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I should probably do that, right? Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll do that. Yep. Okay. So you all know I'm a New Yorker, so that's where it is. You can see the breakdown. Michigan. Ah, come on, guys. Okay. Why is it? Okay. So. First question, real question. The new program requirements contain what percentage of common requirement language? 33, 50, 66, and 90. And we have 78 people playing, so that's pretty good. So remember the requirements, they have the, the common requirements which aren't really editable by the individual RCs. That's an ACGME overrule. And, so and, and those are the ones that are in bold? 
Okay, we've got about half. Come on, guys. Remember, you have to hit submit. That's the other thing. If you have a smaller phone <clears throat> at the bottom, you have to click on the letter and then hit submit at the bottom. Okay, we got about three quarters. That's great. All right, so that's right. So 66%, that's what the percentage of common requirements is a pretty significant amount that we can't alter. Um, yeah, go ahead. So uh, two thirds of the document are common. Um, we don't have the ability to change any of that. Um, and then what the specialty specific language does is to clarify the common requirements. And so that's really what we're doing with our uh, revision here. Uh, there are actually three layers of, of uh, requirements. There's institutional requirements, which you also have to kind of abide by, um, but your DIO and your GME office will mostly watch over that. And then your common requirements, which you're responsible for, and then specialty specific requirements. In addition to that, if you're a subspecialty, there's actually a whole other level of common subspecialty and subspecialty specific requirements. So, just have to be aware of all those different layers and remember as a program director, you're responsible for all of those. Okay, this is an interesting one. How many faculty do I have to have in charge of the practice domains or whatever he's now gonna call these things? <laughs> so if you've read through the draft, you'll see there's some changes in this. So let's Eight, see if you 10, understood. 14, 16, I have no idea. And we now have 95 people playing, so that's pretty good. About half everybody's responded, come on. Okay. All right, so eight is the correct answer. So some people got that right. Quite a few people didn't really know. So eight faculty, basically. Go ahead. Notice the peop number of people that had that that oh, lost. 22% are lost. That's I can good. Under I can understand that, actually, so that's, that's all right. Um, so when you read through the new program requirements, we've kind of changed a lot of language to kind of meld it with the ABR so that we're using a lot of the same ideas. So practice domains are kind of go along with the areas that they're testing in the ABR. Um, but we aren't going to make you have 18 faculty for the 18 different areas that the ABR is tested. So we considered that eight of these are kind of common practice domains at all um, programs. Um, and you need to have one core faculty member assigned to each of those domains for educational purposes. You can designate more than that. So uh, if we go on, uh, these are the eight areas that we kind of consider that you need to have a core faculty member in charge of. So just like in the old program requirements, you needed to have a certain number of faculty that were in charge of the educational content. Uh, these kind of replace those people. They can be the same people, obviously. You don't need to change them. Um, but now it's eight. I think it was 10 before or something like that. I don't remember. Um, so basically this goes along, and you can just click through this real quick. Uh, so basically these match up. We combine GI and GU into abdominal because some programs, especially the smaller programs, work that way. Um, breast is its own. Cardiothoracic was combined, cardiac and thoracic, before we made you have two separate people in charge of that. You still can. You don't need to change that if you don't want to, but you can have one person that is in charge of both the educational content for those areas. Musculoskeletal still stands alone, neuroradiology, nukes, peds, and IR. So there's your eight. So you need those eight people in charge of those eight areas of educational content as your core faculty members. So that'd be a minimum number of faculty you have to have. Uh, you can then start to assign, especially if you're in a larger group, uh, you can actually start breaking that up and assigning it to more. So go ahead. Um, you also will need to have somebody that's in charge of the educational content for the other areas that are tested. So we're not just going to leave those out. They can be the same person. So you can have somebody that's in charge of abdominal imaging and CT, and they should be in charge of kind of making sure that the residents are educated in those areas. Um, but you don't need to separate and have two different people do that. You can, again, bigger programs may want to do that. Um, and then you need to have somebody in charge of physics and quality and safety. Again, they can be some of the same people that you've already designated. And then radiology informatics. Um, and you may not have someone that's radiology informatics in your program, but if you've got some administrator or some of your faculty that are uh, knowledgeable in those areas, you just want to have somebody that can kind of make sure the residents are learning something about uh, informatics as well. 
And again, this just kind of picks up the rest of the areas that the board examines as well. Uh, so basically the modalities, CT, MR, ultrasound. So it picks up, and then we added the informatics because we think that that's still an important part that people need to understand, you know, PACs and how things like that run. So it doesn't need to be real in-depth like, you know, you're doing a uh, specialty in informatics, but um, some education in that area was felt to be important. So just an example, small program may have eight faculty members and a physicist, and that's how they kind of line up and designate the educational content. Um, and then a large program may have, you know, break up the GI and GU. They may have a separate thoracic and a separate cardiac uh, educator. They may have someone specific for MR. Um, so it's a little bit more free form uh, from a program standpoint is how you do your educational content. Um, but you need to designate people in charge of those educational areas. Uh, so more flexibility, I think, in some ways. Um, it certainly doesn't uh, confine you to assigning people to certain things. And we really wanted to uh, go along with the ABR testing paradigm. Okay, so this is an opinion question. So this isn't based on actually reading. We want to know actually how much protected time should, how much time do you think, there's, there's going to be a right answer um, listed, but that's just because they make me do that in, in this particular program. Um, but I actually want to know what your opinion is. So the people that are voting, uh, how much time should a program director get um, for protected time? Why isn't there 100%? 100%. <laughs> Why isn't that one of the answers? Well, I guess that could be E. <laughs> Some specialties, if they're big enough, do have 100% protected Where's time. my chairman? He's here someplace. That's right. How 100%, percent, Jason. OK. All right, that should be a pretty representative symbol. So most people say it depends on size of program. All right, and there's a mixing of B, 20%, and C, 40%. So that's pretty good. Okay, so then we're going to ask you what the new, in the new revised, if you reviewed the revised program requirements, what's the minimum amount of time that we're uh, mandating that a program director should have? So if you did see the requirements, it is a new sliding scale. Um, but there's a minimum for everyone, so. Okay, answer now. We're almost there. All right, so B is actually the correct answer, point 0.4. Point 0.2 is what it is now um, in the new requirements. The minimum is going to be point 0.4. At least that's what we're proposing. And then there's a sliding scale, which we can go to. Uh, so this is the actual language from, uh, which I'm not going to reread, but basically it says that you need to provide uh, support for at least uh, one associate or assistant once you get over 32 programs. So, and then that time can be divided amongst the program director and the associates. So I'm um, going to the next one. So if you have um, 35 residents, and that means 0.7 FTE protected time. You can divide that amongst your program director and your associate or associates, um, and that would count. Um, but if you're below 32, then the program director should get 0.6. Again, if you have an associate program director and you want to share that time and, and you think you offload 0.2% uh, or 0.2, you can do that. So again, it gives you a little more flexibility as long as you meet these minimums. Uh, so it's a sliding scale. Uh, I need to have an APD if you have more than th or 33 or more uh, residents assigned to you. Um, and that's based on the complement, not how many residents you have in your program at any particular time. So depending on what your complement is. Uh, and I think the reason that we wanted to do this is it does acknowledge the importance of the program director, which we do really feel is an important part. And it allows for some variations in support depending on size of program. And I think that just repeats that, yeah. All right, so, all right. Can, can an AOA certified radiologist become a PD in an ACGME radiology program? Yes or no? Binary, yes or no? So we got about half of everybody so far. All 
All right, so the correct answer is yes. Uh, so in the new program requirements, we are allowing AOA uh, uh, certified positions to be eligible to be program directors. That is a change from before where they weren't uh, really allowed, so hopefully that's a good change. To become a, pre a program director, what's the minimum amount of time and years that you have to be a faculty member in a, in a residency program? One, three, five, seven. So although despite asking lots of people and talking to lots of people, they all think that there's a, a number right now, but there isn't in the program requirements. There is no number of years you have to be a faculty member before you become a program requirement currently. But in the new program requirements, we are going to put one in. And that is three, yeah. So three years of uh, being on faculty at an institution before. And again, we're kind of stressing the importance of the program director and making sure that programs really have somebody that knows a little bit about how programs are run. It's fine to have just gotten out and you know, be all enthusiastic about it, but you really do need to know a little bit about how programs are run and have some experience either working as an associate program director or going to some conferences and getting some uh, education on how to be a program director. So we do think it's important and kind of the days of just pointing at somebody and saying you're it, um, really we don't want to see that as much anymore. Uh, we know that there's great people that, you know, can be program directors right out of residency and you may want to have one of those people do it, but you can assign them as an associate program director and then transfer them over after they've had enough time. Uh, you know, to some extent people argue that there's the closeness to residence is an advantage because you kind of know what they're going through, but there's also some argument to say that some distance away from that group of people, especially if you're at your same institution where you've worked with those people, and they were your co-residents, there's probably a good reason to kind of separate that out a little bit. So those are some of the kind of reasons for doing this. ACLS, is it required for your residents, yes or no? Again, a binary. I wanted to ask this as an opinion piece too to see how many people actually make it required at their institutions now, and maybe we can do a show of hands, but. In the new requirements, we are um, saying ACLS is a requirement for residents. A lot of places do it already. With the IR residency, they're requiring it. We think we should be in alignment with that. Um, and it's kind of hard to make a, an excuse for why um, you wouldn't want your resident to be ACLS certified, except for the cost, potentially. Evaluation. How, how quickly do you have to get the evaluations after the rotation is done? One month, two months, three months, six, six months. All right, so one month. So again, we're trying to stress the importance of feedback and evaluation. And so we want you to get your evaluations of the residents back in a timely fashion. So a requirement to have that within a month. Uh, remember that your rotations can be defined differently depending on your program. Some places do four-week rotations. Some people do six or eight-week rotations. Some people do two-week rotations. Uh, so how you define your rotation is really what determines when you need to get that in. So um, you want to make sure you do that. Board pass rate. What percentage of program graduates during the preceding three-year period has to pass the ABR core exam by the time they graduate? 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Reason I like this program, you don't get group thing by seeing the bars go up and down. You just know how many people answered. Uh, so the correct answer got cut off at the bottom, but it is E. Uh, so 90% of, of your residents should have passed the core exam by the time they finish residency. So if you think about it, they take it at the end of the third year. If they don't pass it, they have potentially two more chances to take it before they finish their residency. So a total of three chances for any resident. Um, so having a higher pass rate based on being able to take an exam multiple times um, seems like a reasonable thing to do. And the three-year rolling average should balance out a little bit um, how many or small programs from big programs. Basically, you have more people in your cohort. Uh, so that just kind of says mm -hmm. the same thing. And then this is an opinion. Uh, again, so not looking for a correct answer here. 
if we use a three-year rolling average, how many, would, how many programs, not percentage, but how many actual programs would you expect wouldn't have that kind of a pass rate? I mean, would you think all the programs basically have a pass rate of 90% or more by the time their residents graduate? Or are there 10 programs that don't, or 20, or 30, or a lot? And there is an E that got cut yeah. off. You can yeah, see it so on there, to the right. E is, an e. Uh, hopefully you can see that on your phone screen. That's over there, too. All right, so B, one to 10. So one to 10, that's probably on the low side of what's actually occurring out there. Um, but that's good to know that most people think you probably shouldn't have very many programs that do that, so all right. Can I send my, my resident? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Can, you, can, you, <laughs> um, can I send my residents to an outside physics course to meet the physics requirement, the teaching requirement? Again, yes or no? Hmm. All right. Interesting. So, yeah, kind of an even split there. So in the new requirements, that's not going to really qualify as a full physics curriculum. Um, the, train, the requirement is the training in physics must extend throughout the whole 48 months of DR. So if you just send them off to a course for a week or a month or whatever, uh, that's not going to really qualify as continued physics training. So you need to have a more robust curriculum than that. If you want to send them to a course to supplement their education, you can do that. Um, but you need to have something in place for a curriculum standpoint that involves actual physics education at your institution or an affiliation potentially with a local institution. Um, so we really want to, the physicists really feel strongly that there needs to be a little bit more uh, uniformity of education in physics. Uh, there's quite a bit of variability as you've heard some people in other talks talk about. Um, so we want to try and get a little bit more uniformity of the physics education um, at programs, and it's a little hard right now because some places basically kind of farm it all out, and some places just have the residents study on their own, and some places have really robust physics, and we'd like to see that kind of balance out a little bit. Uh, so you should have some kind of qualified medical physicist or somebody kind of at least advising you or helping you develop a curriculum in physics that's comprehensive. Can my DR residents transfer to an IR integrated program at another institution? So this is going to kind of test whether or not you were You're paying, paying attention, attention earlier. Exactly. Part of the presentation. The reason that this keeps getting reiterated is because it's one of the things I probably hear the most is there, especially among students uh, or residents that think that you can just kind of transfer wherever and whenever, and so you can't do that. Uh, you're not going to be able to transfer to another institution from one program to the next. So really within the same program, equivalent levels. They should occur at the PGY transition, so basically June, July. Um, and once you've started the PGY five year or your R four year, you really can't transfer over. Um, so just trying to keep some control over what happens to residents there. And I think it's probably good for both DR programs and IR programs. Uh, so just general comments, that's the whole quiz. Uh, we're going to put those out for public comment. We really just wanted to introduce the whole, let you be able to see a draft, uh, potentially make some comments today that we'll listen to. But really, if you've got a comment, even if you make it today, make sure you post it for public comment. Um, go on to the next one. I think that's it. Oh, now I have to switch back to my other. All right. Yeah. All right, we won't look how we did as a whole. Let me shut her down. Uh, so a couple things that kind of came up that we already know about. In the old program requirements, there was a specific statement about pediatric faculty exception for small programs or programs that don't have, or that kind of send their residents off to another place. Uh, that got removed from the program requirements due to some ACGME rules about how we can write the requirements. Those will be transferred over into an FAQ. And so that wasn't taken out intentionally. 
it um, just doesn't show up in the draft that you were sent, but it's still, that rule is still in existence, so don't worry if um, you, are, you have pediatric faculty that are elsewhere and not listed at your core um, place. So that's that. Um, remember to make public comments. We'll respond to those as, if they're needed. Uh, you can make individual responses or comments, but also APDR is going to have a, it's going to write a formal response and comments from members. You can also send them on to the APDR leadership, um, and they'll announce how they're going to. Yeah, yeah, they'll announce how um, that can be sent to them. So if you want to kind of have your voice uh, as part of the larger APDR community, um, or give them your opinion about what you think, um, you can do it that way as well. Um, my always favorite ending quote from Alan Greenspan. Hopefully I didn't make too much sense. <laughs> and questions if you dare. <laughs> All right, I'm going to wander around. Uh, um, one question, uh, question for you, Jim. Yep. Uh, I'm Bill Mayo Smith, Vice Chair of Education at the Brigham. And my question relates to the IRDR program. Um, thanks again for giving the presentation. Uh, and I do like your Alan Greenspan quote. <laughs> um, so at the Brigham, we uh, have been approved for an IRDR residency. We've entered the match. We have matched one candidate for this year. So we're, for the rest of the group, we're fairly far along in this process. Yeah. So and just so everybody knows, let me clarify, there were the eight programs that were approved in November managed to get into this year's match. It's not something we necessarily anticipated originally, but it worked. Uh, it took a little bit of work on everybody's part, but we actually managed to kind of run a mini match for seven of the eight programs that um, applied that wanted to do it. They had 15 total spots available in the match this year, and they all filled. Uh, so, and apparently we didn't have too many hiccups or anything like that. So on a trial basis, it worked pretty well. Sorry, go yeah. ahead. So um, the, the question I have for you is, uh, we're in an era of uh, decreased funding. The hospitals are being squeezed. Uh, we're asking our hospital for additional funding for a new residency. Actually, parenthetically, we've just installed Epic at the Brigham. And so they're not really enthusiastic about increased expenses. Yeah. Uh, and so the likelihood of us getting additional funding for the new residency, I would say, is pretty low, uh, which means that if we want to have these residencies, we'll be pulling them from the DR residency. And I'm just curious, you alluded to it, the number of programs that have funding versus are drawing from the DR. And, th and the reason I asked for that is that um, it feels like the DR residency is being hijacked by this new program uh, in the sense, I mean, just being candid, in the sense if you don't have additional funding and you want to do it, either the practice is going to support it or else uh, you're going to have to pull from a different program. And so I'm curious about the number of programs that have gotten additional funding or if this process is going to be reviewed at some point because it's a fairly complicated process to implement at least what we've done thus far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can make some comments. So, uh, you know, so it's a little hard to make complete <coughs> estimates, but we've got a pretty good sense now with the number of applications that have come in. Um, it's a little hard to, without talking to individual programs, to get exact numbers, but we're estimating that by the time all the applications come in, there'll probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 70 new funded positions out there. Um, that's kind of into the bigger IRDR world as a whole, most of it going to new IR-funded positions. Um, so not, not all of the spots, obviously. So a lot of them are going to be transferred over as far as funding. Now, the way I look at it is, and again, if you come, I, I could have spent more time today, but um, if you're really interested, come on Friday. Um, you know, if you really look at the system as a whole, so right now you have four years of funding for DR and one year of funding for IR. If you run the integrated program, it's the same amount of funding. It's still five years of training after the preliminary year. If you run an ESIR program and one year of independent, it's still five years of training, five years of funded residents. The, the bucket, and I understand at individual institutions, sometimes the buckets are harder to move. In some places, they're easier to move. Um, but if you think of it as a big bucket, 
and you can move the money around inside that bigger bucket, then it shouldn't really change how many people you're truly funding as a whole. Since the first three years are equivalent training, you're not really stealing the equivalent number of residents as it looks like. You're really only partially borrowing someone in that fifth PGY-5 year, the R4 year, and, and kind of what some programs already are doing, which are you know large percentage of their time in an area such as IR during that year, um, just because we're now calling them IR, they're really still just doing a fellowship, a kind of a mini fellowship in that fourth year, and then they're going on to one year of full IR training. So the only time actually extra funding comes into account is if you're doing a two-year training program at the end and adding that extra year of training. But, but you're committing at the point of medical school application to X number of spots, and you're drawing that number of spots from your DR residency. So we'll change the match for sure. The match will change. Right now, there's roughly 300-ish, 290 uh, people that are interested in IR in a given year that go on to fellowship. All you're doing is transferring that group of people up front and moving them into that category from that point on. And will the process be reviewed? That was my second question. Yeah. So, I mean, we're constantly reviewing it, <laughs> uh, almost daily, in my world at least. So, yeah, we're kind of constantly keeping an eye on it. I mean, the ABR, the ABMS is, has said it's a new uh, specialty, uh, so we kind of have to work within that realm, um, at least for right now. And because it's designated as a separate specialty, that implies certain things from an ACGME standpoint. But we are looking at the whole process constantly and assessing it. Hi, um, I'm Jamal, not Jason. <laughs> from, uh, um, I'm program director at Yale. Uh, first of all, uh, I really want to congratulate Dr. Anderson and Davis for making it very interactive and interesting. Um, uh, this dry as the subject may be, and also <laughs> even more, <laughs> and even more importantly, for uh, finally recognizing uh, the amount of work and uh, dedication that program directors have, and codifying or at, at least attempting to codifying that increase uh, in the in the in the RRC request. I will take Larry's comment seriously, though, and would suggest that the sliding scale be continued to the very large programs and maybe increase the, the uh, uh, codified uh, support to a full FTE. And I say that, obviously, for personal reasons, our program is greater than 55 residents. Yeah. You might duck if there's any chairs in the department yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a, a couple of quick questions. I know you've, uh, I totally understand that double dipping with res two residents in participating in the same case is a problem. I guess that's also true for uh, interventional cases uh, or uh, 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 whether that's MSK or vascular. But what if they are participating with an other trainee such as a fellow? Can they still count that? Mm. So, you know, so when we're talking about the counting of exams, we're really talking about just for the case logs. That is correct. You know, you can have as many people as you want to learn from the same exam or be involved in the same case. It's just for the counting when you put it into the case logs. So um, I think if a fellow, I mean, the fellows don't have case logs yet, right? Yeah. So, uh, so there is no case log for a fellow. So if you want to count that study as the resident's case, especially like in an IR procedure where they're doing a portion of it, then you can count that as one of their IR procedures because uh, nobody else is counting it in their case log, essentially. Uh, second question is uh, that for your April RRC meeting, I noticed you said that the um, agenda was set in February. We yep. were site visited in March for our um, IR program. Yep. Does it mean that we will be considered in April or we won't be? Most likely. So when we say the agenda set, we're not adding any new things, but the site visits, the applications that are coming on, that continues all the way up until, I guess, now, essentially, or a week, a couple, a couple weeks ago. Long time ago. Okay, Felicia says it was a while ago. But, but the programs that we're getting site visited in, in February, some, if not all of those, are, are going to be reviewed. Not 100% not of them. 
Hi, Martha Monero from Brown University. My question relates to um, PQI projects. And when the ABR uh, recently changed what counts for those of us who are certified, you know, we really heaved a great sigh of relief because we're all doing stuff that improves quality that isn't necessarily in the plan, stu you know, study, plan, do, act, cycle. Um, and the only good thing about when it was MOC that the attendings in MOC had to have those kinds of projects was that it gave uh, cases, if the attendings had to do it, it provided uh, fodder for having projects that the residents could join in on. And I'm a little concerned that now that other things can count, like my time getting ready for MQSA with breast imaging can count for me, um, is, there, is it going to change what is we are allowed to count for residents? Can we have it mimic what the attendings can do? Can we have the resident come join us as I prepare for MQSA and write something up or certify that they were part of that, for example, project? So that's, that's a great question. Um, that's something we're still discussing as a possibility. Uh, to, since it's fairly new from the ABR, it hasn't really come up for full discussion yet, but it's something we'll be discussing. Uh, Matt DeVries from Nebraska. Just a quick question about the ICU month. How robust of an experience are you anticipating that to be? Um, I think just in talking with our critical care units, yeah. they're saying, um, you know, they're more than happy for us to put a a resident on their service, but we're talking now a PGY-5 right. who's been removed from order entry, patient, like dealing with sick people. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, so good question also. Um, I guess the expectation, particularly from, it's mostly from the IR community that's, you know, because this is in an anticipation, either you're in the IR residency or if it's an ESIR, there it's supposed to be a relatively equivalent experience to what's gonna happen in the IR. Community, I think from talking to the IR programs, and maybe there's a couple people in here that I know that might chime in, uh, I would think that it's supposed to be an experience of taking care of patients in the ICU. Now, maybe not at the same level, so maybe, you know, the people that are in there all the time take care of 10 patients, and your resident only takes care of a couple, but that they should be managing patient care. And I realize the time chain, I mean, the distance from when they last did it is significant. In the interest of patient safety. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's, thank you. So Dave Kim from uh, University of Wisconsin. I had a question about the common, the revised com, uh, program requirements yeah. for diagnostic radiology and how it may impact the IRDR residency because in the new, or in the revised uh, requirements, it specifies that the didactic curriculum should ex, uh, span over 48 months. And if we have, for the IRDR, 36 months, and then they go into the last two years more of an IR, how do you reconcile that if they come out with the equivalent DR sort of? So for the, for the size? physics education specifically? No, no, no. It, for... says, it says in the requirements that the diagnostic radiology didactic curriculum should span 48 so, months or 40 So months. in an ESIR program, I mean, if you're a resident in an ESIR, in your DR program, you would still expect them to go to your conferences. If they're in the IR integrated program, that's a separate program. So and it has a different set of requirements. Exactly. They don't follow but, your DR requirements. They, they graduate with a diagnostic radiology certificate and interventional certificate. To me, how is it that a diagnostic program requires 48 months and yet the di diagnostic portion of the IRDR is only 36? I think that's yeah, wrong. That's a good comment. Don't think I have an answer. Hi, Desiree Morgan from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. I got my uh, notification of my self-study yesterday. Ooh. which Congratulations. Means, yeah, thanks. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Woo! Um, but here's my question. So it's due in November, which means my site visit will actually occur November of 2017 to May of 2018, at which point all the transition will be happening. We'll have an IRDR match that has happened. We will be phasing out our IR, but yet all three of my programs, my core and my fellowships that are ACGME accredited will be in place. So do I do two applications for the IR, or do I address every which way we're doing IRDR? I'm just a little scared. Yeah. <laughs> Alicia, you got any guidance on that? Press transitional people. So this... So the self-study at this point really should be focusing on your DR program because if you got an IR program assigned, it doesn't have a self-study date yet because it's still in this initial accreditation 
True, but I got three letters. One's for our IR fellowship, which will be in its last waning year, yes. which I'm happy to report on. If I just want to know if that's all I'm supposed to report on. Yes. Or yeah. okay, yeah. just the fellowship. And so what we've learned through the pilot experiences is that it really is too difficult to completely separate and isolate the fellowships from that process with the core. Um, so again, because you know that it's phasing out, do do the best you can, but it's based on the fellowship and not the IR residency. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I'm Craig Morris from UT Southwestern in Dallas. So I have a question about our program coordinators because I greatly appreciate how you've broken out the FTE requirements for program directors. Have you thought about doing the same thing for our program coordinators? Because I feel strongly we need to protect them, and you know what happens. Yeah. Good ones just get multitasked, and uh, we so, need to protect them. Yeah, so, I mean, we had some discussions about that, and it's been difficult to figure out language that kind of accommodates um, the program coordinators as well as the program, but we'd be happy to hear comments about Good. that during the public comment period. Thank you, because every one of us program directors would say we would not be successful unless we had great coordinators. I 100% agree. <laughs> Um, if I could just add on to that, I completely agree with you. I think um, in our deliberations about the coordinator support, we just decided that there were so many different permutations of that role um, across programs, whether depending on program size, whether you're academic, uh, university based versus community based. Some coordinators are supporting the residency and fellowships. So we decided that rather than hard code it in the requirements, our plan is to develop a sliding scale that will be in the FAQs as a guide. Um, I think we will do some we're, Yeah, we're still trying to figure out exactly what yeah. that will be, but it is, it is something we want to accomplish, but to codify it was going to be really difficult into the program requirements. You can see how complicated it was for the program directors to try and mimic that in, in probably even a more complicated way for the, uh, co or for the coordinators uh, was going to be difficult. So we are working on that in the FAQs, but we haven't finalized that whole discussion and decision yet. Uh, thank you for the lucid, uh, lucid presentation. I'm Paul Jacobson. I'm the DR program director at Loma Linda University. Um, we have um, IR and DR programs that have been established for decades. Um, we're in the process of our integrated site visit coming soon. But um, my point of view from the DR program director point of view, and I, I've been involved in the application, is that DR program directors are sort of being pushed out of IR residency, like have a separate CCC for the DR years of the IR. I mean, it sounds like you're asking, I know the RIR guys, we've got five or six of them, and they're going to be asked to come up with their own DR curriculum, like reduplicate all the stuff we're doing, and so, have their yeah. own CCC, like don't just delegate it to the DR one or be part of it, and it, it doesn't make sense to me, or maybe so, I'm perceiving it, it wrong. Yeah, well, a little bit. So I think it's easy when we say that, that you need to have separate ones, because what we're finding is on the applications, people are just saying our DR one's going to take care of it. And that's not, this is a separate program. It needs to have its own designated. If they want to overlap by 90% of their members, uh, which they'll need to, because for the IR programs, they'll need to have a significant portions of, because three out of the five years are primarily in DR. So they can share. You can even deliberate, potentially. But you need to, re, you need to set up two different ones that are designated, one for the IR program, one for the DR program. And you need to have an evaluation of your program, like the PEC needs to have an evaluation of each of the two programs kind of separately. There can be cross-talk. There can be people that are working commonly on both, those kind of things. We're not saying that you can't be efficient in your use of resources. But on the application, which is really kind of what I was making a point about, is you can't just put your application and say, our DRCCC and PEC are going to be our IRP because that just doesn't work in sure, the language of ACG. They I mean. certainly don't overlap in year four and five, but for the first three years, you know, cr having the IR guys try to reimagine all the work we've done for decades, getting to a certain part on DR so they can be totally independent, 
uh, feels um, a bit much. And I'm also worried that the residents who report to different CCCs for the same portion of the first three years may get different standards or there may be internal conflicts or you may get two standards within one institution. And I don't, I don't want to feel like DR people are not valuable or not welcome in the first three years of the IR residency, right. which is a little bit how it feels. Yeah, I think we don't want to send the message that they should not work together or that you can't share common analysis of residents. So if you, if you want to have your IR, CCC meet, and some of them should be potentially part of your DR, CCC anyway, but you're just saying, okay, we're gonna evaluate the residents in the IR program. There'll be, if you're an integrated program, you'll have, say, one per year. You'll have three that are, you'll need to evaluate. The, the DR program director can't evaluate them because they're not in his program or her program. So they are the ones that are responsible for that. So they have to be at the table. That's kind of really what we're saying. If, if it's the same kind of individuals that are looking at those two, you wanna keep them evaluated the same during those years, so I agree with that. But the person that's in charge of it is the IR program director, so they, you, you can't just say the DR program director evaluate these people uh, during these three years, and then we'll do it the last few years. Richard Ruckman from Monmouth Medical Center. So I just wanna amplify something you said and make kind of a, a, an announcement, which is that um, I've been given the enviable task of uh, heading the task force from the APDR that's going to be collecting comments uh, that will go to the APDR and then the APDR will make a statement. So just to reiterate what you said, it's very important for members of the APDR membership to look for a communication from the APDR leadership and we'll be finding a mechanism for those comments to come to us and then present them to the board and represent the position of the board on the comments. Having said that, spoiler alert, here's a comment. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers become, the numbers of the 90% the 90 hurdle rate over three years, the numbers change as you, as you can imagine as the program gets smaller. Yeah. Therefore, a resident that does not succeed will have greater significance as the number, total number decreases. Therefore, to be specific, if you have a 12 resident program with three residents taking the boards every year and one of them doesn't pass, that, re that program is automatically out of compliance over the three-year look back. That's a problem. I mean, so one resident can sink and put you out of compliance. Now, I know you could round up, but still you'll be below the 90% hurdle rate. Yep. Two possibilities to approach that would be to make it a longer look back or a lower hurdle rate. Yep. And th that's just one of the comments that's come to me already about that 90% rule. Yep, I've heard that comment too. And it's been noted, so yeah, we're very aware of that. Uh, one thing to remember, I mean, not to belittle that because I think that's a very valid comment, uh, but remember these are, um, you know, this is kind of a flag for your overall program. So if that's one thing out of your program otherwise doing well, that doesn't sink your ship or anything like that. But that, that is a very valid point about the size of program and how one resident can affect it for a dramatically long period of time, so thanks. Hi, Rob Kenningsburg from uh, Hahnemann and Philly. And uh, my question is, is similar. The, the core exam pass rate requirement, is that going to stay the same or is it proposed to change? I just want to hear that again. Um, that's what it's set out in the program requirements right now. That it, it won't I mean, say 50% well, we, pass rate? I mean, it'll depend. I mean, public comments we can potentially address and adjust for comments that are made, but um, that's what the uh, committee basically came up with as what we think is. So, so what I think I'm hearing is the, the verbiage from 50% uh, first time pass rate takers to 90% by the end of residency. Correct. And uh, just as a comment, why does that have to wait for all the program requirements to change? Why can't that be instituted sooner? Because that seems like a very positive change. Um, well, so, I mean, to change program requirements, Felicia, you want to talk about the, I mean, it would take just as long, essentially, because basically any program requirement change has to go through the board yeah. and the COR. So all the same things that we're doing for the entire revision uh, would have to happen for that one line change right. in the program requirements. That's how long of a time it takes. So uh, I don't know that it would happen any faster. 
about pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Christian Carlson, San Antonio Military Medical Center. Um, there is a formal uh, program, ESIR, to go from DR to IR. But is there a formal program if you're in the integrated, if you're a resident in the integrated program and you decide, hey, IR is not for me, mm -hmm. I want to do DR? Yep. So you can basically, if you're in an IR program, if you match to an IR integrated program and you're in the R1, R2, or R3 years, and you say, I can't do IR, I mean, you'd obviously talk with your IR director and all that kind of stuff, but you can internally transfer at the same institution over to the DR program. Now, again, I know, you know, hopefully the funding can shift, you know, easily and all that, and I know that's potentially an issue. So that's one thing it's, at your local institution you need to figure out. It's really an issue in the military-wide because if you, if you don't finish a program, you have to go to a two-year utilization tour before you can reapply for residency. So it will really affect everyone in the military. That's good to know. Uh, the other th all right. <laughs> the other thing you is... You might want to write that to us. Yes, I will. <laughs> the, the other thing is, um, was the IR, resident, the IR residency, especially the integrated program, was it essentially thought up to decrease one year of training? Because I really think logistically it would have made so much more sense to have a two-year fellowship if that's what we're really trying yeah. to do. <laughs> All right, uh, so <laughs> that's why I'm walking around, so I can jump out of the way if I need to no. know. Um, so once it was designated as a specialty, and I don't want to go into the whole history again or anything like that, but once it was designated as a specialty, it set off a whole chain of reactions of things. And one of the goals of the IR community was not only to have it as a subspecialty, because of the change in training that they felt was necessary, the, uh, needed a longer period of time, but one of the other goals was to be able to match people straight out of medical school because there's some group of individuals out in the medical school community that maybe don't even go into radiology or interventional radiology because they're more procedurally oriented. They don't want to get locked out of it potentially. So they want to lock that in initially. That's one thought. It maybe it's a small group. It's maybe a bigger group. We don't really know yet. Um, but the idea was the integrated program was more to allow for a passage by matching directly out of medical school and get that group of people that we may be missing potentially um, and allow them to develop a, a robust set of skills in IR. Um, the, the fact that it's a five-year total training period has somewhat to do with the flexibility of the fourth year because the boards are given at the end of the third year now. Um, and some programs were already kind of experimenting with that model and having some success at it. Um, so those were kind of the reasons. It wasn't just to trim off a year. The ESIR, on the other hand, was sort of developed in order to try and make it so that not everyone would have to do two years if they were able to. But it also allows you the flexibility that if you're at one program with the ESIR, you can go to somewhere else and you don't have to stay at the same institution or you're not locked in. So if you change your mind later, Two-year fellowship is still available. I mean, there is, I mean, call it a residency, call it a fellowship, whatever you want to call it. It's still a two-year thing after you do your DR. It still exists. It is there. There will be some people that go into that. Anyone that wants to change career and say, want to be an IR person after they're finished, that's their only option. There is no one-year option anymore for them. Vicki. <laughs> um, I, was, I um, came up here in response to a couple of other comments. I'm Vicki Marks. I'm the Diagnostic Residency Program Director at USC, and I, I am an interventional radiologist. Um, um, I first had a thought about the um, commenting about the ICU, because we've had a lot of discussion in the IR community about the timing of the ICU rotation. It's um, it's, I say, purposely non-prescriptive in the way the program requirements are written. There are no details provided. And part of that is the knowledge that how people get that experience and what that experience consists of will vary from institution to institution. The rationale for putting that experience in the final two years of residency would be for an interventional radiology resident who is more advanced and won't just be an intern, 
to learn about the care of critically ill patients who are frequently the patients that we take care of in the IR suite. So to participate in the periprocedural care of people in, um, uh, who we're doing for GI bleeding or TIPS or other um, critically ill patients. So that's the rationale and how people solve it will vary widely. Um, I know of one program where they've actually added a second ICU rotation to be done early in the residency to kind of maintain a continuity of experience. So it, it can be solved individually um, and it was left non-prescriptive on purpose. So that was one comment. Um, the comment about the um, uh, conference curriculum I think is very interesting because yes, there is a four-year curriculum for uh, diagnostic radiology and for interventional in the residency, there's a five-year didactic requirement. And is there a way to just say, well, the, that one year, every resident in the program doesn't have to go to the exact same conferences? We already do that in our program and with mm -hmm. fourth-year residents who are doing many fellowships. They go to different conferences when they're on their many fellowships. So they aren't all doing the exact same curriculum, but, but it is a formal curriculum. Right. Um, and I was going to talk about one other thing. Oh. The CCC thing. It's <laughs> so um, the, I'm the Diagnostic Radiology Residency Program Director, and so I, Diagnostic Radiologists, will to a large degree be overseeing the progress and the milestones of interventional radiology integrated residents for the PGY2, PGY3, PGY4 years. So what I envision is that there's a CCC, that uh, there's two CCCs that meet together. And the intervention, the, the, you, you have an agenda, and the diagnostic radiology residents are on one agenda, and the interventional radiology residents are on another agenda with a different person who's in charge. But the, the Congress is the same group of people. So that's the way we're going to solve that problem. Yeah. Thank you. I think we left it so that you can come up with some solutions like that. You just. Like I said, it's more for the application. You just can't say one is going to do it for both. Hi, I'm Dave Florelli from UC Irvine. Uh, two quick ones, if I could. Uh, I like the program director changes in the sliding scale for protecting time that you have for them. I think it's going to be very helpful. One question that I had for just clarification is that uh, you say that time can be split amongst the associate PD and the PD, which I think is fine. Uh, but with the integrated IR residency, you also recommend that the IR PD be the associate PD for the DR program. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be two individually busy people. And I can see some programs saying, okay, you get point two, you get point two, we're good. And uh, I don't really think that will work in some programs. Do you guys have any guidance for how to marry those two recommendations? Uh, not yet. Uh, but uh, I think we'll try to come up with some guidance. But again, well, I think, you know, if you've noticed there's a theme to this, we're trying to keep it flexible for the programs. You know, the days of being very prescriptive about the program requirements and saying you have to do it exactly this way because that's the only way you get a good resident are, are gone with the new accreditation system. We're, as long as you're turning out good residents that are well-trained and, you know, we're trying to give some support for the people that are doing the work, the program directors, the coordinators, people like that. Um, but really how you solve some of these individual problems, we're trying to leave it up. But we will try to help, especially with the whole idea of the IRDR and how much time can be protected in each one. Um, that's a good point that it could be abused potentially. Not so, in my program, clearly. Yeah. My no, of course great. not. Um, Nor mine. <laughs> my follow-up question, uh, this, is some, this is separate. It hasn't really been touched on yet. But there's some changes to the first-year call rule. It's going from no in-house call to no directly call unless it's directly supervised. The way we've kind of been doing ours, and I just want to make sure we follow the intent of the change, we've had our first years on a really mini, they, they do call it home from our, for our VA, and everything they look at is final read by an attending radiologist behind them, and oftentimes ahead of them, because the attending tends to be faster. Uh, I, my interpretation is that's no longer going to qualify, that that's not directly supervised, that there's nobody sitting next to this resident, but I want to clarify with you guys before I start telling my chiefs they're going to have to change everybody's call uh, for the next year. So. I think, I think that what we tried to put into language is what people are probably doing anyway from talking to a lot of different people, which is if, you run, if you're running your resident in a supervised fashion the same way you do during the day, during the nighttime hours, 
How is that different than the daytime? During the day, you know, we sit physically together, basically. Right. I, we talk to each other, and we talk and go over the case. Yeah. On this call, the attending's probably not going to call the resident and go over the case unless there's something wrong that they need to talk about. So it would be a slight difference. Maybe I'm overthinking it, um, but it was just a question I had. Uh, I may need to think about that for a little bit. That's what I'm here for, okay. challenging people. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I don't know that you're clearly out of compliance, but I need to think about that a little bit. All right. I'm concerned about the use of the word guidelines for the program coordinators or currently for program directors. I, I just feel like you need to have a mandate that supports them. In these days of cost cutting, if you don't mandate that somebody has a set amount of time, they're not going to get it. I have this awful situation. I have 43 residents. I get 0.2 protected time with no assistant. And it's just, you know, how soon can you make the changes and how soon can you manage? <laughs> we're, we're doing them as fast as we can. I mean, the, I think, so once they're kind of finalized in their final form and go before the board, or once they're approved by the board, even though they don't take implementation until, so say they get approved in February 2017, uh, which we really can't say they exist until then, but at that date, when the board approves them, and we say these are the new program requirements that will go into effect in July 2018, I think at that point, you can go to your chair and say, by next year, we have to have this amount of support or we're not in compliance, and hopefully you can make a case that you can get it as soon as you can. I mean, but we're, we're moving it as fast as we can, given the system. Yeah. And the coordinators, you know, I think the FAQs will spell out what we expect, and so that should be there, too. We're out of time. We're out of time, I guess. So I'll be up here if anybody has any questions. <laughs>